This is the beauty of live television, boy. You can do it on the fly. You can. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, Hampton Conway III is with us tonight. He is Executive Director of Movement Ministries. He's also an educator out in Prince George's <laughs> County. And he has not only a testimony of overcoming and surviving domestic violence, but the sense of acting encouraging and advocating for all of those who suffer from domestic violence, but especially men. Uh, so without further ado, uh, I, I want to introduce to some and present to others, uh, Mr. Hampton Conway. Mr. Conway, got to first and foremost ask you, 10 children, how do you do it? <laughs> I, God I knew that was going to be... <laughs> I knew that was going to be the first question. <laughs> yeah, I, hey man, it's you said God bless me. That's the only reason that way I can do it, brother. <laughs> Dang. Well, thank God. Hopefully, they're not all in private school, because then you'd be bankrupt. Oh no! But... <laughs> oh no! Oh no! <laughs> but Hampton, uh, for those who are tuning in tonight and they're looking at two strong black men and they're saying to themselves. How can you appreciably even talk about domestic violence impacting men? It doesn't impact men. It only impacts women. That's the only place that it happens. What say you, sir? Unfortunately, uh, this issue is an issue that affects many populations, um, not, not just women, not just men. Elder abuse is a big deal. The statistics around elder abuse is, is it would be astonishing for people you know understood the research on that teen dating violence child abuse of course so yeah it happens it happens more than what people realize and it's happening to men uh much more than people realize now a, a lot of people would say how does it happen to men you all are so strong you're twice as big as women you could easily just knock her across the room and leave the house while the police are coming uh, why why is it that you believe that it's men yeah i mean well first of all we have to understand that um domestic abuse or domestic violence is not just physical mm -hmm. um so while yes even myself i endured uh physical violence uh the psychological emotional and verbal abuse definitely outweighed and, and took more of a toll on me than the physical so you know there's more to it than just someone being stronger than another and honestly you know growing up i have one sister and i hit i hit my sister as a kid i hit her one time mm -hmm. my father made it very clear <laughs> that, <laughs> that that was to never happen again to my sister or any other woman exactly and 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 that stuck with me so um i wasn't the type that was going to uh, any violence on a woman. Um, and so when I found myself in this situation in my marriage, um, you know, the most I ever did was restrain her in yeah. order to make my escape. Exactly. I, I want to talk with you about two things, but I want to go back to what you said earlier, because it is a blessing for most men in America to have had a father in the household, especially in a day and age where 80% of America's households do not have one. But you and I both grew up in households with a father. My mom said, if a girl hits you, you got to defend yourself. But my dad, who carried the heavy hand, said, never touch a woman. Don't ever hit a woman. Did you get that type of advice in your household? And do you run into men who did? And how do they deal with that? Yes. Um, um, it's, you know, such 22, because if, if you physically threaten, you have have to defend yourself, <laughs> um, <laughs> you know. Mm -hmm. But because of I was raised, um, I, and that was drilled into, you know, a young person that stuck with me. So I've run into other men that said, you know, I just that's not the way I was Unfortunately, there's also situations where men find themselves being used and they defend themselves and just. I believe, so. but they end up suffering more repercussions than the woman actually you know, 
Lafender. Exactly. Now, we have grown up in an age of feminism, and so let me put this tort question to you. Uh, the sense that the obligation of the man is to always restrain his feelings, his, his you know, adrenaline, always restrain. Uh, and the woman has the right to provocation, okay? But if a man hits back, he's wrong. If he doesn't hit back, and if you can speak to this particular subject matter, that he must be effeminate. He's a girl. He's not handling his business. Can you speak to that, sir, in our communities? Absolutely. I mean, touching on something that's even deeper than where you and And this not only touches on how we handle it in this situation, I think this also touches on ability to express to any what may be going on, right? So because of what he says, or what the coach says about how I should and what as a man and as a black man, mm -hmm. you know, we know brothers talk stuff in the bar. Show enough. Brothers sit there, <laughs> but, but brothers at the barbershop tie their women going upside their head. Don't say that. Nope. Because that's a cool thing to say. That's not a thing to say. That's a thing to be experiencing. Right? You know, what society should be. So to your point, absolutely, you know, to, to even admit that this is happening as a man, man somehow be <laughs> admitting you're not as much a man. Exactly. You know, and unfortunately in our communities, we have given the space to, to be vulnerable, to express emotion, because if we were vulnerable, if we express emotion, then that means something else, right? Exactly. It doesn't we're just being human and never in touch with ourselves. Something else. Exactly. You know, we come up in an age where men are not supposed to cry. Uh, exactly. Men don't cry. You know, you handle your business, you suck it up. But let me just ask you, is it also advantageous for the woman to know that she can provocate without fear of physical <laughs> violence, but also have the social, cultural uh, spectrum that says that because he doesn't react, you have control over him. You you got it going on, girl. You know how to handle your business. Is that some of that psychological abuse that's going on in the home as well? Absolutely. I definitely believe that all men, for for a multitude of reasons, yes, all men would not have tolerated what I tolerated, especially and for as long as I tolerated it. Yes. Um. So, yes, I, I do think you know women do know how far they can go with certain individuals based on you know they learn what their personality is, what their demeanor is, what their or is or isn't, and so they push that the limit. So yes, um, they. They know, learn how, even if it's again, it's not, you know, mm -hmm. um, you know, the biggest about abuse, whether it's man or woman, you know, it's about power control. And, and so, 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 you know, for whatever reason, you know, that person feels like to have power control over, over this other person, and they do that, you know, any means they can't leave financially, you know. Uh, all kinds of different in manipulating uh, that person that relationship. Uh, Mary Brockman in our chat role tonight, my bouncer in chief of the chat room, uh, states that that type of abuse is generational. Um, and when we talk about generational, most times people are saying that it's men teaching men to do that. Are women teaching women also to be <laughs> abusive to their men? Yes, it goes both ways. Because at the end of the day, let's just look at the scenario. Let me take my scenario. Yes. I had children in the. So, no matter what I'm saying out of my mouth, 
what happens from the children observing how we are interacting with each other, they are learning, mm -hmm. right? It's, yeah. it's, it's learned behavior. So, so they begin to form, oh, this is what marriage is supposed to look like. Oh, this is what relationships look like. Oh, I hear daddy say he loves mommy. I hear mommy say she loves daddy. So this is what love looks like, mm. right? So these things become normalized. So when they enter into their own relationships and some of these things start to happen, it's not as offensive as it should be. <laughs> yeah. Because because for them it's been normalized. Exactly. Hampton, you were in a relationship of abuse. You mentioned that uh in this interview. Uh and you are a well educated man, a very strong guy. You look like you're kind of buff there. And most people would say, wait a minute, you brought that on yourself. You knew what she was mm -hmm. like before you married her, right? And so, you know, that's an interesting, I mean, you're asking all the right questions, man. You, you, <laughs> must, you, you, must, you must do these interviews every now and then. I do every um, once in a while. <laughs> <laughs> so, yes, it, what's interesting, and one thing you have to understand, too, is very often, um, it's not uncommon for abusers to be too, you know, to present themselves as different people, mm -hmm. um, especially to the public. Um, there are politicians and clergy and, <laughs> yes. and, and well-known folks in the community that if you ask the community about that individual, they are revered in the community, but behind closed doors, they're another person. Yeah. And so, you know, and that is common. That is very, very common. Um, if you were to meet my ex-wife today, you would walk away from her saying, wow, that's a, a beautiful, you know, compassionate, uh, you know, caring woman. You would have no idea um, about, you know, the things that took place or, you know, that were taking place in our home. Um, so, and as far as knowing beforehand, a lot of <laughs> much of what I experienced in the marriage, um, I'll give you an example. Like I didn't know when we dated, I didn't know she cursed. She really? never once oh, she did not curse around me. She didn't curse to, at me. She didn't curse to anyone else. I didn't know she actually used curse words. Mm -hmm. A few months into the marriage, I realized she must have held some kind of world record for stringing curse words together. <laughs> I got to ask you, because a lot of people, you know, because I've done marriage counseling um, on both sides of the of the chair. Uh, and people say, well, how come y'all didn't talk about this before you got married? Y'all should have talked about all this stuff. Why do you talk about that, Hampton? Let me tell you something. There's a lot of things <laughs> that. Actually, I'm done. I just got remarried in August. Congratulations. I was tw about 25 when I got married time. Trust me, I had a whole different set of prerequisites going into it this time than I did the first time. Mm -hmm. So yes, that is a good point. There are conversations that should have been had. I will admit that. You know, there were things that there are more things that I should have taken the time to learn. Um, so I will absolutely admit that, that that is very wise in certain conversations you absolutely should have um, and certain things you absolutely should do, uh, you know, before getting into a marriage. Uh, yeah. But but even if you don't do those things, you need to understand that you still don't deserve uh, to be hurt and to be abused. We're talking tonight with Hampton Conway, the third. And I am telling you right now, this brother, I am going to have him come back uh, on our show and talk about uh, domestic violence and about the ministry that he's in, Movement Ministries. So don't think that this is an abbreviated interview, uh, ladies and gentlemen, or that I don't like him and I'm trying to cut him short. No, we got about five more minutes in this interview and I, I, I wanted to talk longer with him because this issue is huge in urban America. COVID-19, mm -hmm. some people uh -huh. didn't know who they were with 
until the doors completely closed and they couldn't come back out. Sir, has your ministry been virtually, you know, burdened with an overload of people who said, wait a minute, I didn't know he or she was like that until I was stuck Listen, with her. We have been hearing this all over the place. You know, October was Domestic Violence Awareness Month. Yes. So at that point, you know, we'd been in the COVID situation since March. Yes. And so there, I had a lot of different speaking engagements in October, collaborating with a lot of other domestic violence organizations, and they were all saying the same thing. Even did a, um, a, a, a an event with the state's attorney from Prince George's County here in Maryland, and she, even she was talking about the statistics and and more people. This is the first time I've heard more or other organizations talk about how much they're seeing women versus against men uh, in these situations. COVID has revealed a whole lot um, and, and exposed a whole lot. Is it simply because you at home? Because I know my my dad um, before <laughs> he had his hip surgery, he would get out every morning after his retirement and he would go do a job or something. He would do work. He didn't stay home with mom. You know, is it simply because people are cooped up or is there some mental illness related to this? Oh, I believe it's both. Mm -hmm. I believe it's definitely both. But I mean, if you think about it, you know, uh, I know for me, um, work was my escape. Yeah. You know what I mean? And so I can't listen. I can't imagine Thank God I am not in this situation. The COVID didn't happen 10 years ago. Yes. Brother, I, I can't tell you how, how detrimental. I mean, it was already a dire situation, mm -hmm. you know, but I just can't imagine being quarantined. And the kids, too, you know, thinking about the kids. And so yeah. that's one of the things, you know, as an educator, I've been trying to share in different settings because when student, when schools do open back up, there's yeah. going to be a lot more traumatized children walking in these doors, and we got to be ready for them. Exactly. Now, you know, uh, NBC News did a report earlier this week that stated that black and Hispanic, as well as poor kids, have suffered the most as a result of the COVID closing of schools. And part of that is academic, but the whole idea is sometimes the social impacts the academic. Am I right in that regard? You are absolutely right. Aside from the fact that there were disparities to begin with, with yes. respect to access to technology and the internet. Um, and so, yeah, you're absolutely right. Just you, the, all that coupled with uh, things socially, as far as, you know, you think about it, if you've got parents that are laid off now, mm -hmm. they're not able to provide the same level of, of care or food uh you know to, to nourish the children and then you know you've got traumatic situations that are happening in the home that are even if there was already that environment then it's exasperated by everything that's going on so yeah it's no wonder um why some you know children are going to be suffering even more now i want to ask you this final question and trust me hampton you will be coming back on this show and we will be talking because christmas is coming and that's people don't believe it, but that is the worst time of the year for domestic violence, uh, Christmas. But there are some who think, and this is for an adult oriented question, so if anyone takes offense to it, uh, blame the fact that I'm an adult. But there are some people who have listened to songs talk about first we break up and then we make up with the code being that we have a violent altercation, yet somehow we come back and we love one another. Is that normal? What is per conveyed through music and movies? Is that normal? And how does it impact those who have relationships in our culture? I do think it, you know, I, I, yes, in some sense, it is normal, but it does because it's normal doesn't always mean it's healthy, right? Yes. So, um, and 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 you know, just you know, from one adult to another, um, one of the questions that people always ask me is, how could I be in a situation like that? Because by the way, 
all 10 of my children are with that same woman. Yes. And so people can ask me, you know, well, how in the world did you end up with 10 kids in a situation that was, you know, supposedly so bad? Mm-hmm. And one of the things I would, it is kind of threefold. One, there was some deception uh, with respect to birth control. Um, two, um, there was a situation where because we weren't getting along so often, I felt like that was one of the few ways we could connect. Yes. And so I was so, so pressed and so desperate for any kind of connection that that was one of the ways we could connect. And then the the, the other factor was, you know, if I ever denied her because I was tr- actually hurt and wouldn't want to engage in that way, um, then I knew a fight was coming because now I'm getting accused of being with somebody else or mm-hmm. this, that, and the other. So I would go ahead and honestly, I would, I would compromise and have sex just to avoid a fight. Hampton, I thank God for you coming on the air with me tonight. I am so sorry we had the intricacies, the difficulties, but trust me, the next time you come back, I got a tenfold question for you. But <laughs> I know that there are men sitting at home tonight, and you know how we brothers be sitting there at home. We ain't saying nothing. We just watching, you know. But they want to get in contact with you. They want to say, I'm feeling you, man. I, I'm feeling you. But I'm not trying to blow up your phone line, and I don't want you blowing up my phone line because she's looking at my cell phone. How can I contact you? How can I communicate with you so that I can deal with my issues as a man? Absolutely. So if they go to my website, uh, makemoves.org, they can see there's a contact form there to fill out. Even at the bottom of the page, there's an email address and there's a business phone number. So they can use the contact form and um, I will see those emails and I will definitely reach back out. Thank you, brother. Hampton Conway, ladies and gentlemen, what a great blessing to have him on the air with us tonight. Domestic violence impacts all of us, oh. every single one. Don't think you the only guy, okay? First and foremost, don't think you the only guy. You're not the only guy or not the only gal. And if you're teenagers and you are in the process of being in a relationship with one another and you're slapping on one another, You both need help right now. Get the help that you need. Hampton can help you with that. God bless you, sir. We look forward to you coming back on the program very soon. Appreciate it. Thanks for having me. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, Christmas is coming up. Uh, It's a great time of the year to give away gifts, but it's also one of the most sullen times of the year because people can feel how lonely they are, even in a crowd of people. When we come back, ladies and gentlemen, Colonel David Giamona is with us tonight. He's the author of The Military Guide to Armageddon. uh, And you can find him on Twitter at Giamona. Uh, David, uh, suicide is very high uh, in the United States as a result of the COVID-19. And not only that, suicide is very high for those individuals who have come back from war. We want to talk with him about all of that and his chaplaincy for 32 years and the secret instructions. They're not really secret, but they won't be after tonight. This has been a truly great evening. We will be back with more of it right after these messages.